The demographic transition and the economic development <coughs> process are intimately connected. Uh, and I believe that the lessons both of history and of theory, if I could put it, and I would always put it in that order, uh, what we've observed and what we can reason about uh, that process suggests that uh, a demographic transition to low fertility rates is a critical component of successful economic development. <coughs> and Africa is the last region in the world to have the transition to low fertility. <coughs> and the consequences of that, I think, are uh, quite important and uh, will become even more important in future years. Let's look at uh, some of these uh, patterns, but let me start with a striking fact, at least absolutely striking for me. According to the UN Population Division, and everything I'm going to say is based on UN Population Division numbers, Sub-Saharan Africa's population in 1950 was 179 million people for the entire uh, region. Currently, it is, for 2013, best guess, around 900 million. So this is a five-time increase in a little over 60 years. That's stunning. That's dramatic. That changes a lot. Uh, it changes a, a tremendous amount about economic life, about uh, infrastructure burdens, about uh, water supplies, about uh, traffic jams, uh, and uh, the capacity to absorb a rapidly growing urban population. Uh, and it has a lot more effects than that as well, as I'll emphasize. But a five-time increase in 60 years is an absolutely remarkable phenomenon. Now, there's an even more remarkable uh, scenario uh, that the UN Population Division put out in its 2012 revision uh, last year, and that is that on the medium scenario, it's not really a forecast because the UN would not say that they're forecasting, but they make, as you know, uh, three scenarios, a medium or central uh, reference scenario, and then a high fertility scenario and a low fertility scenario. And basically, the high fertility scenario is plus 0.5 in the total fertility rate, and the low fertility scenario is minus 0.5 uh, relative to the reference rate. So the reference rate is, if not a forecast, uh, it is at least what's regarded as the central tendency on current best evidence. That has Africa's population continuing to grow very rapidly in the 21st century. Any guess of what the year 2100 medium uh, fertility scenario population for Sub-Saharan Africa is? It's 900 million today. Who wants to take a guess? This is the Two central billion. tendency. Two billion. What? Two billion. Two billion. That's low. Hmm? That's high. <laughs> now, now, we, now we've got it bound. So 3.8 billion. That's the reference scenario. Think about it, a continent going from 179 million to 3.8 billion in 150 years. Of course, if it happened that way, the world would never have seen anything like it in history. Uh, and uh, Africa's share of the world population would rise in that scenario from something like 7% as of 1950 
to something on the order of uh, about 35 percent of the world's population by 2100. You can see how completely astounding that is. My view is that this is uh, not compatible with Africa's development aspirations uh, and not compatible with human well-being and not compatible with uh, environmental sustainability. Um, and so I think something would give, but like Malthus taught us a long time ago, 150, uh, 215 years ago, uh, things can either give the soft way or they can give the hard way. Uh, and uh, giving the soft way means an accelerated demographic transition uh, that is done voluntarily and uh, comes about quickly. I believe that's utterly feasible. The hard way means that the population continues to grow rapidly but becomes inconsistent with well-being in a lot of ways, uh, food security, uh, escape from poverty, and the result is conflict, unwanted uh, mass migration, uh, and so forth, and, uh, and vulnerability to disease, famine, and other disasters. And I can tell you one thing about the world that surprises me still till today, if such calamities come in the future, no one's going to be there to do much to help. Uh, we are entering a much tougher, nastier world in a lot of ways where there is no rescue uh, in my estimation. So better to get it right than to count on someone to come in and, uh, and uh, make a rescue after the fact. So that's the theme that I want to look at. Uh, what is the realism of this? Uh, and what are the implications of trying to bring about a faster voluntary reduction of fertility rates? Uh, and the argument is very positive. I don't know, and people in the room can fill me in on the literature better than I know, I would guess, I would suspect, uh, I don't know of many economic studies that actually take the fertility rate as the policy variable and then look at a general equilibrium uh, vision of what those implications are. And that's what I'm trying to do. But it's quite rudimentary in part because there isn't a lot of uh, structural work that does this. But I think that there should be. And one of the things that I'm hoping a more modeling can do would be to help policymakers, national leaders, for example, understand what the real choices are for their countries in a much clearer way than, than they do right now, in my view. I had one long, almost eight hour debate with President Museveni on these issues uh, a, a few years ago. Um, I don't think I convinced him, he didn't convince me, uh, but he saw absolutely uh, nothing wrong with the massive continued rapid growth of Uganda's population. Uh, and uh, that is a view, of course, that many uh, political leaders um, continue to hold, and I think it uh, needs to be changed because I don't believe that it's an accurate view of the economics. Yeah. Jeff, actually, uh, back in the 70s, the Census Bureau did have a group, and we did try and model this, and it became, we sort of developed into futures group, and those those models, we used to work out with all the countries, okay, this is your demographic growth, yep. this is your economic growth, and they had about the same kind of impact as what you described. Uh-huh, okay. It was a great modeling exercise. I think it would be great to, uh, if you could help me find those and, and uh, yeah. bring, bring them uh, back to uh, life and uh, update them uh, also. Maybe the discussion would be a little bit different mm -hmm. now after this five-fold increase of population. And one of the striking facts of Africa is that it's the last region in the world, not the last, there are countries outside of Africa with high fertility rates, but just a few. 
Uh, Africa is <coughs> the only region in the world where there's a widespread, still very, very high total fertility rate. Um, and so maybe the views would be, and, and many African leaders these days are saying we need to do something about this. So it might be very timely to, to look at those models again. And I'd also like to know how close I came to, uh, to, to the framework. So let's just have a look at uh, where things stand right now. Uh, back in 1950 to 55, uh, fertility rates around the world varied between five and seven. Uh, and uh, Africa already, uh, as of the earliest dates of the UN's population, measurements had the highest measured total fertility rates in the world, uh, the red line uh, at the top. Uh, and uh, what you can see is that uh, a really accelerated decline began in the mid-1960s uh, with many new population programs starting and, and family planning as a major theme of global public policy uh, and a theme of the United Nations for a long time. Um, that, uh, and of course, the economic development that encouraged this as well endogenously, so it's not only policy driven by any means, uh, it's driven by many factors that I'll describe in a, in a moment. But you can see how the huge gap opened up with Africa, uh, which did not have a discernible decline of total fertility rates into really the 1990s. Uh, and even today, the declines are not very strong in the rural areas. They tend to be stronger in the urban areas. There's a big urban-rural gap. And uh, the overall fertility rate still remains about five and a half uh, total fertility rate for the entire region, whereas it's basically at or near replacement rate for the rest of the developing countries. And here are the scenarios. These are the medium scenarios of the popula UN population division. The Pop division models basically are all models of con gradual convergence. Uh, and so in the UN population division, long-term modeling, everything comes to replacement rate in the long term. Uh, even the high-income countries where total fertility rates are as low as 1.2 or 1.4 right now, in the UN's models gradually rise back up to 2.05. There's no deep reason for this. Uh, but this is uh, to get a stable population in the long term. Um, the UN did, uh, as some of you uh, probably read, one forecast to the year 20, 2300 a couple of years ago. Very interesting scenario when they predicted that Italy's, or they didn't predict, but on current trends, if the TFR remains as low as it is in Italy, if you play that out to 2,300, the Italian population drops to about 600,000 people. Uh, so everybody gets their own hill town, basically. Uh, and uh, they can have their own vineyards and, and their own manors and, and all the rest. It sounded great to me, but um, it, was, it was a little bit shocking. Uh, for you see how different uh, Africa is from the world in this scenario. And indeed, Africa doesn't even reach a TFR of three by uh, mid-century. So this is a very gradual uh, decline. And one thing that is also interesting is that when the population revision of 2012 was made, all of the population numbers were raised because the fertility declines have been even slower than the pop division has been assuming in its recent estimates. And this is their argument that there's nothing that's really pushing this uh, demographic transition very fast. If you uh, look at the other side of the uh, demographic ledger, Sub-Saharan Africa also stands out uniquely. And I think this is causal. 
Uh, of course, the causation runs in both directions, but I'm going to emphasize the causation running from mortality to fertility, uh, though it also runs from fertility to mortality. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has a unique disease burden. I think it's one of the absolutely distinguishing features of Sub-Saharan Africa in long-term development. It has a burden of disease that is unlike any other part of the world. And it shows up in the numbers, and I can tell you it shows up in gut experience of economic policy practice also, because I've worked in every region of the world, and you never feel in any other part of the world the pressures of disease the way you do in Africa in every aspect of policy making. Uh, it is uh, a stunning fact. Now, why this is, isn't really known. Of course, one argument is Africa's poor, and therefore uh, the disease burden is very high. But if you look at a simple regression analysis, for example, of infant mortality or U5 uh, mortality rates uh, on per capita income and some other variables, and you add in a shift variable for Sub-Saharan Africa, you find out that Sub-Saharan Africa's uh, mortality rates are maybe even as much as 50 per thousand higher, controlling for the normal explanatory variables. It's really amazing. I think that this is deep disease ecology myself. And I put malaria as one of the absolute crucial drivers of this in long-term history. And there's a lot to be said about that that would take us a, a bit uh, off, off course, but it's worth pondering that if you take a global perspective, Africa is the only region with a massive burden of uh, hemoglobin anomalies related to, uh, to malaria. Uh, of course, the Mediterranean uh, also has hemoglobin anomalies uh, associated with the malaria burden in the Mediterranean basin, but nothing like the sickle cell anemia that one finds in West Africa. And we know from Hardy-Weinberg principles that that's telling us a very important lesson, which is if you see a population with this uh, very, very high rate of uh, hemoglobin S alleles uh, that uh, are the uh, sickle trait, and one realizes that when they're homozygously inherited, that's death. And so to have a, a uh, and, and when they're heterozygously inherited, so you have one allele that is the anomaly and one allele that's not, that's protective. We know from first principles that that's telling us that the mortality associated with malaria must be stunningly high because otherwise such a terrible trait would be selected out in just a short number of generations but to persist as an extraordinarily prevalent trait means that 30 or 40 percent of the mortality is associated with malaria or in that case really with malaria uh, and that is the West African experience and looking at the underlying uh, reasons for that there really are very fascinating uh, also in from a human point of view, tragic reasons for this uh, extraordinarily high disease burden that don't have to do with public health and uh, with uh, public policy and governance, but have to do with ecology and the kinds of anophilines and, uh, and uh, the, disease, the temperature patterns and the rainfall patterns that make most of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, uniquely highly burdened. And I've argued over the last 15 years not without controversy, but I've argued over the last 15 years that malaria, just that single disease, has played an extraordinarily important role in shaping Africa's long-term development. And for the reasons that I'm going to talk about here, by boosting the mortality rates, 
considerably, even though, quote, it's only young children, and that only is not meant uh, in, uh, in a human way, it's meant in, a, uh, in an economical sense, uh, this can stop a demographic transition, and that can stop economic development to a very important extent. So the point is that you see that Sub-Saharan Africa is standing out among developing countries both on the fertility rate and the mortality rate side. And we should understand first that's unique, looked at regional scale. Causation does run in both directions because high fertility rates cause children's deaths uh, in the sense that uh, less spacing of births uh, it means uh, poor nutrition. Uh, it means uh, uh, mothers uh, unable to uh, feed, uh, breastfeed their children adequately or to households unable to support their children adequately. But there's a direction of causation that's very strong from high mortality to delayed reduction of fertility rates as well along the standard demographic transition theory. And this is the cross-country correlation, just as an example of the x-axis being the under five mortality rate and the y-axis being the total fertility rate. And you see that, roughly speaking, it's a pretty good fit. Uh, and generally, a U5 MR on the order of 200 per thousand is associated with a fertility rate of six to eight, and a U5 MR of 20 per thousand is associated with a total fertility rate of about two. And this is also very interesting. So I'm viewing this causally. Uh, again, there are lots of arguments about how causal, and one would love to statistically uh, identify the causation, which I've tried to do in a recent paper using malaria disease ecology as an instrumental variable for the mortality rate to be able to drive the causation statistically from mortality to fertility. And we find a, that this approach holds up with what I regard as a sound instrumental variable. But think about what it says, because I think it's really quite interesting. <clears throat> Suppose this is a causal relationship, just for purposes of analysis that if you have a under five mortality rate of 200, you don't choose to reduce family size because of the high uh, likelihood of children's death. And if you have a uh, mortality rate that's quite low, then you accept a small number of children in the confidence that they'll survive. If you look at the quantification of this relationship, it says that high mortality is associated with stunningly high population growth rates, which is paradoxical at first glance, but absolutely the pattern. And if you think about the numbers, it's clear. One-fifth of the children die in the high mortality zone, but you're having six children, say, then five-sixths of the children are surviving. And I'm sorry, if it's one-fifth, let's say it's one-sixth, uh, let's say it's, uh, it's one-fifth and, and you're having uh, six children, then four-fifths of the children are surviving and roughly the total, uh, the survival rate is 4.8 or 5, and half of those uh, will be a girl. Uh, and uh, that means each mother is having, a, is having about 2.5 surviving daughters on average. And that means that the net reproduction rate across generations uh, is, uh, is 2.5. So if that's really true, what <coughs> this relationship is saying is that high mortality is associated with stunningly high population growth rates. <coughs> because of the more than compensating offset of fertility. 
Is that plausible? I think it is plausible. Uh, it, it's not a sure thing by any means, but it is plausible if two things prevail or some interaction of two. One is that families want to absolutely be sure that they have surviving kids. And if you have a lot of risk aversion of losing all the children, and this can be from the point of view of old age security, or it can be from the point of view of religious rights and, and, uh, uh, and uh, making sure that your children can pray for your spirits and all the rest, uh, it, then it's possible that even a probability of one-fifth is enough to induce an over uh, supply, if I could put it that way, actuarially, that is several times. Uh, if you're absolutely out for a 95 or 98 percent certainty of uh, surviving kids. If you add in one more fact, uh, and that is uh, son preference, male preference, then this is a tremendous added boost. If you want a surviving son for sure, and child mortality is very low, two kids on average will do it. Some households would have daughter, 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 and maybe a, a son afterwards if they're really uh, going for the son. Uh, but some would have the son first, and on average it takes two. Uh, whereas uh, if uh, you want to have a very high probability of the surviving son, uh, statistically you might need three sons to ensure with high probability that one will survive, and to have three sons requires six kids on average and suddenly you're really up there in the total fertility rate uh, zone. So my feeling is that this kind of relationship is a causal relationship, and that in history, Africa's very high mortality rates have been part of the reason for a very pronatalist culture uh, and a very pronatalist outlook and a very delayed demographic transition. Now, that's all good news from the point of view of the story I want to tell because we're in a period now because of advances in public health where mortality rates can be driven down very far, very rapidly, and where access to contraception, <coughs> improved uh, modern long-term contraceptives can be uh, made uh, feasible very, very quickly, that I believe that the timelines for rapid voluntary fertility reductions can be shortened from what often played out over generations to a <coughs> year period, and should. This means that everything I'm talking about when I talk about reduced fertility is in a context of reduced mortality. So I'm talking about introducing a comprehensive public health program, part of which is already underway in most of Sub-Saharan Africa, but intensifying public health, child survival, maternal survival, and as part of that scaled up intensified primary health system, access and encouragement of long-term contraceptives and smaller family sizes with the idea that this could lead to a much quicker decline of fertility rates. So the implication of the medium forecast I've already described, back in 1950, Africa and Latin America had uh, roughly the same population. Uh, And you can see this uh, incredible divergence, which is uh, now underway because Latin America is stabilizing population. Uh, it's uh, basically peaking because fertility rates are below replacement in many countries in Latin America. Uh, and Africa's population continues to soar. And as I noted, it's already reached about uh, 900 
uh, million as of here, as opposed to 179 million there. And it's on its way, as I noted, to 3.8 billion in 2100 in the medium scenario. And you can see the other regions at Asia is uh, still growing fast because of the age structure, <coughs> but, and especially India is, ask, is going to add uh, another 500 million people roughly in population by mid-century. Uh, China is peaking out at about 1.4 billion, currently at 1.3 billion. So Asia will stabilize and decline in this medium scenario, but Africa continues to soar all the way till the end of the century and beyond. Uh, and this is uh, what uh, concerns me. So what are the implications of a very high fertility rate? They are multiple. And this is what economic modeling, I think, uh, is important to <coughs> mobilize. There's some very simple things that are detrimental. Uh, and uh, of course, whenever there are fixed factors of production, whether it's land or water supply or ecological services or oil under the ground, which is supporting a national economy, rising population diminishes the per capita values of those critical resources. One of the most striking is Africa's arable land, which is limited because most of Africa is dryland. Uh, there's a very difficult uh, tropical rainforest uh, of the Congo Basin. Uh, there are a few pockets of uh, very humid uh, uh, ecology, the uh, Gulf of Guinea for countries uh, from Liberia to Cameroon along the, uh, the west, uh, the Gulf of uh, Guinea coast. But most of Africa is desert or hyper arid or semi arid or subhumid. And that means that the ability to move. Uh, open up more arable land is quite is limited by water basically and a lot of parts of Africa are going to become drier with climate change as well climate change is going to do a terrible uh, amount of damage to Africa though exactly how is not known one thing that is known is Africa is hot and it's going to get hotter and a lot of the crops in Africa are already at thermal limits so productivity of maize and other crops are already limited by temperature. And when you raise temperature, especially nighttime temperature, you reduce crop yields. But even the land area has been in this very steep decline. And if you go to African villages all over the continent, they'll tell you, my grandparents had four hectares, now we have 0.2 hectares to farm, uh, or 0.4 hectares to farm. And so there's been a tremendous shrinkage of farm size and very, very heavy crowding in uh, many parts of Africa. And this rapid growth of population obviously is going to tremendously exacerbate this. A second feature, of course, is the age pyramid that comes with a high fertility rate and a high population growth rate. And this is, from an economics point of view, an extremely basic and important fact for a number of reasons. But if you think about the age uh, population, uh, the, the uh, uh, age population pyramid, Africa is a very, very uh, wide base of the pyramid, uh, a very narrow base at top. And most of the developing countries now are basically uh, becoming uh, almost uh, um, uh, not quite uniform yet, but uh, uh, a um, much more rectangular rather than pyramidal shape. And this is the uh, already showing up in the ratio of the young to the working age, which is a dependency rate that is a very large burden on the economy because young people are uh, dependent on uh, on uh, the work, the workforce of their parents. And you can see what's happened here, uh, that uh, the population zero to 20 
relative to the population 20 to 65. So I'm taking 0 to 20 as the youth population uh, predominantly out of the labor force, though we know a lot of 0 to 20s are actually working compared to the working age population. And you can see that the young are greater than the working age population in Africa, but in the rest of the developing world have already started to decline very, very steeply. There are, there's one absolutely mechanical result of this and then the real economic result. If you think about GNP per capita, which is our shorthand measure for economic development, GNP is produced by working age people. And so you can think easily uh, and accurately about GNP per worker as being the appropriate measure times number of workers per capita. <coughs> and when you have a rapidly growing population, the workers per capita is low. And so mechanically, all those children around are part of the denominator but not part of the numerator of GDP per capita. And so Africa's GNP per capita compared to other parts of the developing world are reduced even essentially mechanically by 30 to 40 percent by this different age structure. But there's a lot more dynamics that are associated with this as well because the large populations mean other things that the amount of investment that has to be made to keep up with the growing population is very large and that means that saving that could normally be used to for development is instead using just to catch up with growing population. So economists talk about two concepts. One is capital deepening, which is raising the capital stock of a country per capita, and the other is capital widening, which is raising the capital stock just to keep up with population growth. And the saving in a society has to be devoted to both. And if you have rapid population growth, more saving has to be devoted just to keeping up with the growing population. And less is available to get ahead of the curve, as it were, because economic development depends on a rise in capital stock per person. That capital stock is both the physical infrastructure, the business capital, and also the human capital. So if you have to build schools just to accommodate a growing population, the quality of the schooling per child is not going to improve. If you devote the same resources increase to a stable population, it means that you're able to invest more and more per child. And so that's the second, not mechanical, but economic implication of this rapid growth rate. So in this paper, I create a little analytical model, which I'll describe to you in a moment, and then use it to compare two scenarios. One is a business as usual scenario, which is the medium forecast of the UN population division. And the second is an accelerated <coughs> demographic transition scenario, which is based on a faster uh, reduction of mortality rates and then the assumed change of fertility rate happening instantly along with the decline of mortality. So let me explain that for a moment. Normal demographic transition theory says that the leading factor in the transition is the decline of mortality rates. And after an interval, fertility rates adjust downward in line with the lower mortality rates. And what I'm assuming is that we can shorten that gap essentially to zero in this first exercise, that one can have a very rapid transition, both of mortality and fertility, through an integrated program of public health that includes primary health care, child survival, family planning, uh, and maternal health, crucial. Uh, in all its aspects. And I'm counting on the presidents, the cardinals, the imams, all to stand up and cheer. 
right? Right. Uh, and uh, this, I think, is uh, quite seriously important that uh, a quick fertility reduction is a public social event. It's not just a private event. It's changing cultural norms quickly. That's happened in most of the world. Of course, the demographic transition can happen without that, but it takes more time, and I'm assuming a quicker transition. 